Right, uh, good afternoon. My name is Tom Vincent and this is my second year research project um, assessing the impact of wave exposure on the intertidal gastropod Gibula umbilicalis. Um, it's a comparison between sheltered and exposed shores. Here is a little bit of background information about them. Gibula umbilicalis are really, really abundant around the western seaboard of Europe. They're absolutely everywhere. Um, really tolerant, they can take a load of change, um, which is perfect for me really, because that's what I wanted to do. Basically all I want you to get is that they're really abundant and they're great. Um, they're, they're really important as an ecotoxicological bioindicator. So the last few years it's kind of become apparent that in, in order to effectively um, assess the health of ecosystems we need to use bioindicators as well as water sampling and all that sort of stuff. Um, so the beauty of these little beasts are that they are absolutely everywhere. There's no threat to the population size, so you can do what you want with them really in the nicest way possible. Um, and they accumulate loads of chemi chemical contaminants. Um, so really importantly, oh that's a nice, that's really interesting as well, by Cavacin yards and all that lot. That was released in 2015, so that kind of shows the importance of the species as a recent bioindicator. Um, yeah, importantly then, the fowl, uh, it has, an has a, hist a history sorry, of industry, so loads of agriculture, mining, the docks, and more recently, aquaculture, right up towards Tro. Um, this is a picture that I took last year after heavy rainfall, so I don't know if you can kind of make it out, but there's loads of muddy runoff and loads of disgusting stuff in the water, basically, after rain. So it kind of shows the importance of working out how to measure these chemical con contaminants within farmland. Um, so my study was to understand the behaviour of Gibula umbilicalis in respect to kind of using it as a species, as a, uh, as a species, as a bioindicator in the future, um, a nice little baseline sort of study. Um, these are my Gibula umbilicalis. Um, right, so previous studies, really interesting ones, uh, Takada, he did a, a similar study in Japan on mono monodonta labia, which are pretty much um, an identical species just on the other side of the world. Um, uh, so he's a good one to have a little read of, even though it's 10, 15, or 20 years old now. Um, and Gendron, again, he did a similar study, but on periwinkles in Wales. So they were my bibles for this study. Um, I changed my site to assess, well, to, to assess um, wave exposure. So I had one sheltered site, uh, two sheltered sites, sorry, one exposed site. My exposed site is literally 100 metres from where we are now. So even though it doesn't look like there's a lot of waves, throughout the winter we get an increase in easterlies, southerlies, loads of winds bring up short period uh, waves. So summer we have very little wave action, it doesn't look like it on the graph but it really is. Uh, winter there's a lot more wave action here. So I chose it um, as a nice sort of transition site because we can see a transition um, going into winter, increase in wave action and then we can work out what's going on. Um, so yeah, I've, I've borrowed this data from the FAB test site, which is seven miles away. That just shows you a kind of increase. So site one exposed literally just here. Site two is on uh, off of Calamansac Wood, so in the Helford, sheltered, uh, sheltered year round. Sorry, um, all three sites are ecologically and morphologically similar. So it'd be no good choosing a beach and then a rocky shore because that showed me absolutely nothing. They're all, all three of them are rocky shores, they're pretty similar, um, they're within 10 kilometres of one another, so same temperature, all that sort of nonsense. Uh, site three I chose my control site, which is the east side of Pendennis, um, so it's kind of handy to have one sheltered site as a control to compare everything against. Um, and this is my methodology, I don't know why I put these in. Um, but, so basically it's a modified Peterson Mark recapture experiment, so as you can see, spray painted a tiny bit of paint onto um, each different animal, marked out a grid on each area, so 50 metres or so uh, along the whole rocky shore, going at spring tides to ensure that I've got the whole uh, grid there. Marked out all of them, 14,562 in total, um, so that's a lot of neurofen after all bending over all day. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, was, um, yeah, marked them all, measured them all, counted how many there were, wrote it all down. Um, for each site. Fortnightly revisits to um, work out exactly what was going on. So I had to do it on spring tides to ensure that I had the greatest extent of the rocky shore. 
um, and find out exactly what's going on. It's fairly obvious that by spray painting these, these animals with bright pink fluorescent paint, they're going to be a target. Um, so there's quite a few little things worth reading about when it comes to is it really ethical, all that sort of stuff. Yes, it is ethical, I reckon, because they're everywhere. Um, <laughs> there, there, there was no real uh, threat to the species. So, of course, crabs really, really like them. They're really tasty for crabs. So, yes, maybe it made life a bit easier for them to find them, but that's what happens. Um, what I wanted to find out then, for the end of my, my experiment, was are they going to move down the beach? Yes, they did. Um, so, oh, uh, yeah, they did move down. That's the most important part. Um, Site one, really nice and easy to see. You can see that at the start, I marked loads of them on the uppers, and as we progress, the kind of numbers went down towards the middle and the lower, so they did move down the rocky shore. Site two, similar, which is quite weird, but kind of expected. Even though it's a sheltered site, you can see that I marked a lot in the middle because it's kind of uneven, so um, that's kind of irrelevant when you undertake statistical testing. But there is still a kind of net movement of uh, downshore migration. And it's the same with site 3 and my, my control. Um, so clearly, wave exposure isn't the, imp the only influence on migration patterns. Um, so what I've kind of gathered is it isn't the only um, influence on migration patterns. It's probably down to temperature, food availability, and seasonal fluctuations as well. Give you that bit of colour, don't like the cold. No gas report really does. Um, they're really, well, they're not that picky, but uh, other studies have shown that when it starts to kind of get freezing, like in the winter months, they're going to escape and get in the sea where there's more food, it's warm, it's a more stable environment. So this has literally just shown that wave exposure shows more uh, downshore migration when, there's, when there are waves, as opposed to when there aren't waves. So that's pretty much it. My recommendations are, if I wanted to expand my current experiment, I'd rather have a longer study period because I only used three months, which was nice going into the winter, but ideally a year-round study would be much more efficient for getting better data. Again, larger samples because 14,000 isn't enough. Um, and then other kind of variables that you can use to assess behaviour of gas pods, food availability, temperature, water quality, and light availability. They're the other ones that I think impacted on my experiment the most, so it would be interesting to find out exactly the extent of those variables on migration patterns. Um, thanks to everyone that helped me with the experiment, and thanks for listening.